Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first event of 2021 for the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa Foundation, the 2021 Hacks Alive webinar series under the theme Bridging the Gap. Thank you for joining us. My name is Yvonne Botre, and I am the representative for the Ghana branch of the Haxa Foundation. This year, Haxa will host six webinar events over the course of six months under the broad theme of Bridging the Gap. We chose this theme so that we could explore, discuss, and highlight the various ways in which we are eliminating the linguistic, cultural, social, geographic, or trade-related barriers that keep the African diaspora apart. Today's interview is the first of this six-part series. Now, before we get into the details of today's session, it is important that I give you more information about Haxa Foundation. Most of you in this webinar have been longtime friends and supporters of Haxa. But for those of you that are new to the organization, I'll just give you a brief overview of what Haxa stands for. Haxa stands for the Heritage and Cultural Society of Africa, and our mission is to promote and celebrate African heritage and culture and celebrate the achievements of peoples of African descent. Please visit our website, www.thehaxa.org, and follow us on social media at The Haxa for more information. You'll see the links in the chat box. I now officially welcome you to an interview with His Excellency Ambassador Kwesi Kwote, Deputy Chairperson of the African Union. Our topic of discussion is breaking down the African Continental Free Trade Area AFCFTA agreement. On January 1st, 2021, the African Continental Free Trade Area, also known as AFCFTA agreement, went into effect. As many of you may know, the AFCFTA is now the largest free trade area in the world, creating a continent-wide market comprising of approximately 1.2 billion people with a combined GDP of approximately 3.4 trillion US dollars. We are so very honored to have as our first webinar guest for 2021, His Excellency Ambassador Kwesi Kwote, the African Union Deputy Chairperson to discuss the AAF-CFTA agreement. His Excellency Ambassador Kwesi Korte is a Ghanaian national with over 35 years of experience as a diplomat. He is currently the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union and prior to his role at the African Union, Ambassador Kwote served in various capacities in Ghana's embassies and high commissions in Cotonou, Cairo, Brussels, Havana, and London. He was also the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Ghana Mission to the United Nations in New York. Under the former President of Ghana, under the former President of Ghana, John Mahama's government, Ambassador Corte began as the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister and was later promoted to the role of Secretary to the President of Ghana. Ambassador Corte has extensive experience in the area of financial economic negotiations with the European Commission, expertise in foreign policy, investments, and providing legal advice on administrative and international law in his previous role with the Provisional National Defense Council, PNDC, for the State Committee for Economic Cooperation. He holds a Bachelor of Laws degree honors from the Faculty of Law for the, of the University of Ghana. He has a Barrister and Solicitor of the Supreme Court of Ghana certification, and he is a registered notary public. Welcome, Your Excellency, and thank you so much for joining us today to discuss the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Your Excellency, to begin, 
Please share with us your involvement in the origins of this groundbreaking agreement. Thank you. You, you recall that um, I was ambassador of Ghana to Ethiopia and to the African Union from 2008 to 2012. Now, every year in the AU, there's a theme for the year in which every focus is put. Now, in the year 2011, the theme of the year was intra-African trade. And the conference for the ministers, African ministers of trade was held in Ghana under the chairmanship of the uh, Minister for Trade of Ghana. Now, as a result of having hosted the trade minister's meeting, when he came to the summit, the keynote address was delivered by late president. You know, as a Mills was a professor of taxation, company law, commercial law, University of Ghana. He actually taught us in the faculty of law and he has no expertise in this field. Now, in his speech to the summit, he emphasized the importance of setting up a continental free trade area agreement. He also emphasized the common passport, the common citizenship, the free airspace, all initially derived from Kwame Nkrumah's African Mass United chapter 7. And if you permit me, can I read a few lines from chapter 70 of Africa Mass United, entitled Economic and Political Integration. And Kwame Nkrumah suggested an African common market devoted uniquely to African interests more efficaciously promote the true requirements of African states. Such an African market presupposes the common policy for overseas trade, as well as for the African trade, and must prepare, preserve our right to trade freely in it. And it goes on. Besides, this market is not an African market, but we do have a competition that presently exists between us and must continue to do so in one of us installations. The tax laws I will produce was more so I combined to us with a second position and so it united the policy and the to strike better prices. For instance, Ghana and Nigeria between them is on 50% of the world's people. So far, we've been saying against each other, uniting our policy to compete the underclassing taxes of the price. The, the theoretical basis, the historical basis of this CFTA lies in the thinking of Kwame Nkrumah and the foreign policy of Ghana. So in Prof. Mill's speech, he pronounces on these matters and throws a challenge to the summit to be able to put this as a target before the year 2020. And this is exactly what has happened for the AU to pursue this. So really, uh, the impetus for this lies in coming to West Africa must unite through Ghana's foreign policy. And it is perhaps a factor of uh, a telling notion of poetic justice that CFTA Secretariat happens to be in Accra today. Now, when this agreement was brought up for signature, that was in Kigali three years ago, uh, Ghana offered to host it because President Kufuadu believed that through that, the center of gravity of economic progress slowly gravitated towards Ghana. And he put in a lot of effort, he campaigned, he gave them a $10 million grant to set this thing up. So we have now this thing in Ghana. So the potential for this is going to liberate the forces. You're going to have 1.2 billion Africans as a potential market with a value of 3.4 trillion. What is left for us as Africans now is to be able to take advantage of this. And how do we do this? We need to step up our democratic game. We need to work towards a truly literate and enumerate Africa so that we can leverage science and technology in the industrialization process. It is through industrialization 
that Africa can begin to win back to the first century. So this sets us up very nicely, and it gives it give impetus to our ladies, our women who are petty traders posted across the borders. It will facilitate, remove the obstacles, and it will really promote trade and economic matters. If you ever live in the United States and you see the trucks going from east to west, from north to south, across the highways, you see why Kwame Nkrumah, who was educated in the United States, caught up with the idea of a continental nation built and developed from various individual nation states. Now, perhaps at this point, we should also examine the origins of the African nation state. Now, the origins of the African nation state really lie in the Conference of Berlin in 1884-85, the activities in prelude to that and after. The Act of Berlin, which emerged from that conference, drew out the borders of the African nations, and that is, those are the borders that exist today. So in essence, really, the process of African integration from a continent that endured slavery, or a continent that was divided up in Berlin, it's an attempt by the African Union to reintegrate, to disentangle itself from the north to which our nation states were tied in from Berlin 1884-85. So it is a historic moment. It is a moment of great uh, transcendence for all of us. And what we need to do now is to raise our governance, our rule of law, our democracy, and slowly move the rest of the masses of Africa with the African Union. And in that, in doing so, bring the African Union Commission as an organization, the African Union itself, under the able chairmanship and leadership of President of South Africa, Syria Maposa, nearer to the African people and give it more relevance and more impetus. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kwesi. Thank you, Ambassador Kwesi. That was wonderful. I think you've um, you've highlighted that it's not just the agreement, but we also have to do our part to be able to support the benefits of the agreement. Now, I think mm -hmm. if we could go we'll dive into a little bit deeper, if we can highlight what are the key benefits of the AFCFTA. You highlighted a little bit in your um, response to our first question, but if we could just dive into some specifics. You know. So far, most of the countries have agreed to remove 90% of their tariffs. Intra-African trade will be easier, most tariffs removed. And as we move on, we believe that as the agreement gains traction, most countries will remove all their tariffs. And if they do that, trade flows, investment flows will become easier. Africa will become a more attractive center for investment. Now, you know, in Investors are hard-nosed people. Capitalists are always looking for the rate of return. Already, the rate of return in Africa is the highest in the world. But because of political instability, because investors are not so sure about the rule of law, the court processes, they are still relatively hesitant. But when these challenges are removed by the continental free trade area coming to existence and showing the value that can be derived from working in Africa, when every investor knows that you have a fair shake in a fair legal system, a fair juridical system, which is common across the continent, they'll begin to see Africa from east to west, from north to south, in the same way the United States developed from 1776 going. So we, we, we lay in the groundwork for what will eventually become a United States of Africa along the lines of the US government of today. The Europeans developed the European community from the European coal and steel, com steel community. Now it has become the European Union. And when you drive from Paris through Belgium to the Netherlands, you don't even remember that there used to be borders, that there even used to be war between these people. So the potential value of it, because it's going to raise the standard of living, the rising standard of living, 
it's also going to bring greater governance to be greater comparison between various nation states and we'll see the more common aspects that they have together and we'll slowly build an africa which in a um uh, agenda 2033 we dream of an integrated democratic peaceful africa at peace with itself and holding its own with the rest of the international community that really is what we, we, we're driving at and i think we're on our way wow that is a high ideal and i do like the if we're laying the groundwork for the united states of africa that is definitely something to be working towards now, I think I'd like to dive into a little bit because you've spoken about truthfully the um, historic nature of this agreement. Mm -hmm. Many of us have not had that privilege, that rare privilege of being involved in the creation of such a historic mm -hmm. agreement and mm -hmm. one that has the potential for real transformative impact. If you could, could you kindly describe that experience and what it was like? Um, it was a fairly difficult experience. First of all, you need to persuade various different officials from different countries that they were, they were going to be winners and losers. But in the long run, the benefit is going to be spread out. Now, in this process, we, we had the benefit of a very brilliant Nigerian diplomat, Mr. Osakwe at Ongtad a trade expert who led us through these negotiations. And they went through all the nitty gritties of tariff barriers, uh, uh, trade law difficulties. And with the support of some very patriotic and very progressive banks like Afrexim Bank, under the chairmanship of uh, a, very, a very prominent Nigerian professor, together with the African Development Bank, guaranteed to underwrite the various losses that may arise and also make it possible for various countries to be able to pay for their goods in their local currency. And that is a big innovation. We, we owe it very much to the progressive thinking of the Afrexim Bank and its uh, chairperson. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. So for those of you that are just joining, we are honored to be speaking with His Excellency Ambassador Kwesi Kwote, Deputy Chairperson to the African Union. Your Excellency, as we understand it, the AFCFTA is one of the key components of the first 10-year implementation plan 2014 to 2023 under the AU's agenda 2063, the Africa we want. In your opinion, what does an Africa that Africans want look like? All this to the exceptional leadership of Mrs. Clarissa Kusazana Zuma, who was chair of the African Union Commission for four years. Now, she set off officials on a basis across the continent to interview various classes of people all around, workplaces, civil society organizations, ministries, parliamentarians, to get a gist of what we think Africa will want should be like. Now, what came out was that Africans want to be able to travel across the continent, their continent, without having to go undergo the stresses of border checks unnecessarily. They want to be able to have one common passport. They want to be able to drive from left to right. They want to be able to shop anywhere. They want to be able to entrain themselves and exercise their Africanness everywhere. They also want to link up with their brothers in the Caribbean, Black America, and Brazil, and the rest of it, where people of African descent were taken away through the slave trade. She encapsulated all this in a book that she called the Africa we want. And she also puts the progress in stages of 10 year periods. So in the first 10 year period, one of the key flag ships of ambition with the CFTA. And then as 
the work progresses, we seek to drive the other ambition. So we owe that to her. And she encapsulates, you know, in introducing the Africa we want in her inaugural address at the 20, 2011 or 2012 Africa Union Commission meeting. She had an allegorical letter to a musical Kwame. Clearly, she's talking about Kwame Kuma. And saying we are in the year 1963, almost 100 years after your book, Africa Must Unite. You have achieved the continental railway system, you have achieved the common passport, you have achieved the African Central Bank, you have achieved the African Defense and Political Organization. Indeed, I'm reporting to you that your dreams for which you went and died are slowly achieving them. In a very interesting manner, she was referring to the debt, the intellectual debts that the Agenda 2023 owes to Kwame Krumah's Africa Must Unite. You all know that Kwame Krumah lived and died in Africa, worked and was overthrown for it, but history has come to absorb him. History has come to show the validity of his ideas. And in many ways, people can die, but ideas do not die. Once you have them written down, they may change with time because ideas change with the movement of history. But the essential elements of what we have now as uh, agenda to history are very close to what he originally conceived and tried to implement 50 years ago. And in many ways, you can see that even now, we are a few, a few score years behind him still. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. So we owe a great debt to her as well as to Kwame and Kuma. So Very much. Your, yes. Uh, your term as AU Deputy Chairperson is yeah. slowly coming to an end. That's right. Yes. Um, kindly share with us some of the highlights of your tenure. Well, um, it's been ups and downs, you know, helping to run a large organization like the African Union Commission is not for the faint hearted. Uh, but I can say that during this period, we were able to get the statue of Kwame Nkrumah finally situated on the African Union headquarters building. We have a new headquarters building. We also be able to get the statue of Haile Selassie because Kwame Nkrumah worked closely with Haile Selassie to have the Addis Ababa as the headquarters. We are now slowly, almost at the point of getting the common African passport because really when you have a common passport, which is which can be, you know, the, the contours can be agreed on and can be reproduced in every, any of the nation states, we are slowly, almost unconsciously, removing the barriers between us. We are working closely between Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone, and Arab Africa. We see more of Africa as a political entity rather than linguistic groups which bear the hallmarks of the colonial regime. And as a result of that, um, many foreign entities are more and more anxious to work with us. They, they're taking Africa a little more seriously than before. And that's precisely because now Africa has a, a potential market of 1.2 billion people, of potential value of $3.4 trillion. Africa has the youngest relative population in the world. That throws us also the challenge as leaders to have a massive educational program to remove completely illiteracy from the continent. Now, if you have a literate in a numerate Africa, you are setting the foundation for industrialization. So what is industrialization about? Industrialization is application of science and technology to production. So the conditions have been created. Uh, of course, it imposes challenges on African leaders African leaders have to begin to think more continentally. Coming when you talk about continental planning, we are not there yet, but we are beginning every year the leaders meet, they think through issues, they ask themselves questions, they get to know each other. 
and they are gradually, gradually, slowly pursuing a common agenda for Africa. For me, that has been the most satisfying, satisfying uh, results, or the most satisfying work that I have to do, I've done in my life. Because you, as you work together in Addis Ababa among African diplomats, you even begin to forget that you are from different countries. You are beginning to truly see each other as just Africans, African diplomats, African officials working for Africa, working for a common continental nation from a nation from various 55 nation states. We are now thinking continentally, we are planning together, and slowly we are inculcating this in our youth. That's why education is so important, political education is so important. We're emphasizing democratic governance. We have the APRM, so African leaders kind of compare notes with each other. It is not entirely without friction, but at the root of everything, I think we're making considerable progress. And for me, that is my heartfelt joy to see this slowly unfolding. And it's been a privilege to have been associated, however minimal a manner with this. Thank you. Thank you. The work that you've been doing with the African Union over the course of your career has truly been laudable. And, um, you know, we as a group, um, all Africans, we are indebted to you for your work on our behalf. Thank you, Ambassador. No, actually, I'm just a civil servant, doing my duty as a civil servant to the continent. Thank you very much, but I'm privileged. Thank you. So, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, we are actually now going to turn to questions from our audience. As part of the registration process, you will notice that we asked you to submit your questions in advance. And we received a few that we would like to ask at this moment in time. So Ambassador um, Corte, our first question is from Derek Owusu. Derek asks, how do you think Ghana and Africa can, can position themselves at the fore of the blue economy? By, by the blue economy, I, I believe you're talking about an economy that is operating at optimum levels. You are not necessarily talking about a maritime economy. Yes, the optimum in, level. Yeah, in, in that, in that, in that, in that state, that means that uh, we have to position ourselves. You see, uh, there is an uh, American professor of competitive strategy called Michael Porter, and in one of his books, Competitive Strategy, he talks about Development, not necessarily being the privilege of countries with natural resources. It's all about development being the result of good governance, of transparency, of allocation of resources according to value and not necessarily according to connections. He's talking about the rule of law, generalized. And those are the elements that are critical in the blue economy, whether you're talking about the micro level or at the macro level. It means that things must follow logic and productivity must be increased through better ut utilization of resources. It also means that value must be added. And at the root of that, all that, is a population, an African population, that is truly literate and truly, li truly numerate. It means that African governments must emphasize on compulsory education, secular education for all the citizens. That is, that is what the Germans did, that is what the Koreans did, that's what the Chinese did. And we must also have a balance between laissez-faire and planning. You must have a balance. You, there are some things you can plan. There's some things you must let the market decide. But we must also consciously move ourselves towards what we want. If you are graduating 100 students from university, we must be preparing a place for 100 students to work. If you are graduating 1,000 engineers, you must have a program that is ready to absorb thousand engineers. We don't just leave things to chance. So it means a more conscious effort 
at creating what you want and uh, less of laissez-faire. But it's a question of balance, it's a question of one's political orientation. But you must, above all, carry the population with you because the population must be able to express their satisfaction with you by regular, democratic, free, open choice elections conducted in a manner that is acceptable to all, that even the losers acknowledge that they have lost. Kofi Annan has a, a book on the nature of elections with integrity and how they can contribute to national renewal and continental development. Those are the things that I believe uh, are important to the African Union and even to various African nations. Thank you, Ambassador. Our next question. I, I, sorry, I noticed there's a Basibaita somewhere. That's my prefect in, uh, in Ashmota. Can I say hello to him? Hello, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Please go on. Yes. So our next question is from Lungi Morrison. Lungi asks, as an international diplomat, do you think there might be a disconnect between the diaspora and young Ghanaians slash Africans in the, on the continent? And if so, how can it be bridged? Thank you, thank you very much. This is an interesting question. First of all, when you talk about the diaspora, you could be talking about Africans who have been abroad through education, have naturalized and stayed abroad, like my preferred Basabaita. Or you could be talking about Africans who were transported in the 15th, 16th, 17th century through the slave trade. That's the other aspect of the diaspora. The two are not necessarily the same, but there are links between them. The larger question of the diaspora, we're talking about places like Cuba, places like Jamaica, places like Barbados, uh, Brazil. You'll be, you'll be surprised that they all have an interest in how the continent evolves. And even more so with the Africans who, because they, they have gone and educated abroad and lived abroad, they are first or second generation Africans who are outside the continent. They have an even more greater interest in how the continent operates. We need to make Africa so attractive that they can operate and assist us in whatever they want. So there's a definition of the diaspora according to the Executive Council of the African Union, which says that any African, whether living on the continent or outside the continent, who is ready and interested and prepared to work toward the development of a continent is accepted as a diaspora and are constantly regarded the whole lot as a cis regime. Now, the importance of this is that because they've stayed abroad, because they've worked in highly competitive and developed economies, they have acquired skills and experiences and ideas that can be of great use to the African continent. And they also have the sentimental feeling about Africa. Sometimes it's even greater than those of us who are still in the continent who take things for granted. So the thing is to develop this bridge and give them the possibility of contributing in any way that they want across an African continent which is not free of the strictures of borders so that they can go where they want and they are the people who come because they really want to come they are the returning migrants and they have greater value they have a great value to us and we really really through haxa through a group like haxa we develop the link between africa and her children abroad and reintegrating the greater african family that's the african renitas our, our which uh, President Tabu Mbeki so eloquently spoke about and wrote about. So that is the value of HAXA for us. Exactly. Thank you. You really highlighted the raison d'etre for HAXA. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Princess Nanayao Tete Kudro. Princess asks, what is in the AFCFTA for Africa's women? Yes. You know, most of the Trans-border trade is carried on by women. If you go to the border between Ghana and Togo, between Nigeria and Benin, 
most of that trade is by women. Our women are very industrious, but they face obstacles each and every way. They have to pay bribes to immigration officials who impose all kinds of obstacles in their way. The CFTA automatically remove all those obstacles. And it will make it possible for them to form associations and then establish themselves wherever they find most profitable. And, you know, if their, their endeavors or exertions become profitable, we expect that our nation states, our international organizations target them and develop their expertise, give them capital to be moved further afield. They become small and medium industries. And those are the motors of development for Africa, I believe. Thank you, thank you. Our next question is from Natasha Gordon. Natasha asks, Africa comprises a range of countries from those large and more developed to those small and less developed. How can it be ensured that all benefit from a win-win AFCFTA? Actually, this was one of the major issues facing the negotiations. And um, those who have, more, who have more expertise in this area than I have had to tangle with this problem. And there are various uh, built-in measures to protect the less endowed and against the greater, those who are greater endowed, and also to ensure that we carry everybody with us. The arrangements as of now may not be perfect, but I can assure you it's a very key issue that is engaging the minds of the trade experts and engaging the minds of our very brilliant Secretary General Wang Kele Benny. So thank you for this question. It's a very important matter for us. Thank you, Ambassador. Our next question we have from Sandra Tete. Sandra asks, COVID-19 has shown us the importance of solidarity and unity. Do you think we might be seeing a greater exchange of resources and R&D across the continent? Or will it be more localized in similar blocks or have a wider reach? Well, actually, you know, the Chinese have a saying that every challenge is also an opportunity. Now, when COVID-19 hit us, the first reaction of various countries was just to close their borders. Everybody closed their borders. And then suddenly they found out, no, they were closing themselves in. So it, it compelled us as a, a continent, as a continental organization, to mobilize African Center for Disease Control to engage with our partners. So for instance, Jack Ma and the Chinese brought us equipment to the African Union. The African Union then consulted the various countries about how to open their borders to be able to access this equipment in the fight against COVID-19. It has also, COVID-19 has also taught us that not every encounter, not every meeting need be physical. We are learning now, as we are now doing this webinar, we are learning now to meet by Zoom and in virtual space. So challenge COVID-19 is clearly, but out of this challenge, has brought us new and innovative ways of working together and beginning to understand that solidarity is a key to solving this COVID challenge. So in many ways, it may not be exactly a blessing, but it has opened our eyes and made us more alert to the things that we could do differently, and we're doing that. Thank you, Ambassador Corte, thank you. We do have some questions um, from uh, the audience. These are not in advance, but I think we have some time to be able to answer, to be able to ask them. We have a question from Joseph Mamfi. Joseph asks, as one with such a wealth of experience and knowledge and an astute student of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and one with a passion to see a united Africa managing its own affairs, 
what are your next steps as your tenure comes to an end? And how do you plan to still contribute as we can't afford to let such a great mind, you know, um, I guess, go into the background, essentially. We do still need you. I, I tell you, Joseph, I'm, a, I'm an old man seeking to retire quietly. But I, I hope that I can work with organizations like HAXA to exchange uh, views through seminars with uh, international relations institutions in Africa or in Ghana, wherever. Um, I remember I had the similar privilege of doing a lecture on the slave trade in Marcus Garvey Hall in Kingston, Jamaica. That was one of the most inspiring activities I've ever engaged in, and I look forward to more activities of that nature. But I, I my, my bones are weak now, and I, I'm looking forward to retiring in Accra and resting a bit and reading and writing. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. We do have another question from Elisha Inditik. Sorry if I apologize if I've mispronounced your last name. Um, her question is, how do we harness Africa's youth dividend to push the AFCFTA agenda? Thank you for this question. You know, our youth is our greatest asset. And we in Africa are fortunate to have 70% of our population being under 21. Now, that is as much a challenge as an opportunity. Now, without planning, without education, without acquisition of culture and literature, science and technology, it becomes a threat. But with proper planning, with education, with culture, with science and technology, Africa's youth become the greatest assets. And so this is now a challenge for African governments and the African Union is intensely engaged on this. We are a very dynamic commissioner for education science, and technology and this is her passion, how to turn our youth into capital. Now capital, what is capital? Capital is value, which increases its value. And you can only do that through education, science, technology and training and link it up with employment so that they can really achieve their heart's desires and, don't, and not feel uh, compelled to cross the Sahara on foot and get drowned in the Mediterranean. That aches my heart so much. But, you know, I think this is what we have to all concentrate together and try to achieve. If we can do that, the flower of our youth will be the best evidence of an Africa which is integrated and self-confident and able to express itself in whatever way it demands. And we know that our youth are very hardy and they're capable of very much, but it's up to governments and leaders and civil society to mobilize this youth and make the best of what God has given us as Africans. Thank you, thank you. Our next question is from Kenneth Nemo. Kenneth is asking, where can we access the full charter of the AFCFTA? Are there centers that entrepreneurs can access for further information on the requirements and modalities in participating in the AFCFTA? I, I think they're, they're available on the AU website that you can even Google them. They, everything is there. Great. Our next question, we have another question from Derek Owusu. Um, Derek is asking, and it's similar to a question that we also had in the chat from um, one of our key HAXA supporters, um, Rocky um, Dawuni. Dawuni, sorry. Yes, um, yes. How, how is Rocky doing? <laughs> we'll be speaking to him, uh, I think, a little bit after as well. But the question is how can we implement the importance of heritage and culture in the policy of the AFCFTA, seeing that other countries have shown us how crucial social economic factors are to a country. You know, you know, culture, culture pervades all aspects of our life. Culture really is how we live our life. It involves music, it involves dance, it involves drumming, it involves business, it involves science and technology. Culture is everything. And the, if there's one thing that uh, distinguishes Africa and the Africa is a very strong culture that even years of foreign domination has not been able to damage. So what I expect is that 
as the AFC FTA allows us to trade and to better our lives, culture, which is the way we live our lives, will improve. And the cultural expressions in our books, our songs, our sports, uh, our traditions will improve. And they will be modernized because you have a society which will be static, but be dynamic to be able to cope with the energy that the CFT bring out. So culture, of course, is not static, it's a dynamic concept. And I believe our culture, we put the right emphasis on it, can cement and improve and even add value to whatever else we're doing. Great, great. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Corte. Um, what I'd like to do now, I think, unfortunately, our time has come to an end, um, but what we're going to do is, after the formal program, we're going to open it up for people to be able to engage with Ambassador Corte and be able to ask their questions directly. But we'll be concluding the formal program, and then we will conclude, we'll enter into sort of the informal um, in-person engagement with Ambassador Corte. So for the formal program, I think we will just have you, if you have any final comments um, before we kind of end this session and then enter into the next segment. I, I, I cannot um, end this encounter without paying particular tribute to President Rollins, who just passed away. Um, those of us in Ghana, and those of us who are fortunate enough to have been in high school with him, including my preferred Basil Baita and others, remember him and his love for the greater African family, the Caribbean, the diaspora, the Black Americans, love for arts, music, and culture, and what role he played in restoring the authority of the state in Ghana. I would like to respect to the family to his lovely wife and lovely children. Uh, once again, express our condolences to them and to tell them that Africa forever remember this great person who lived among us. Um, I don't think I have anything more to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. Um, that's a, quite a fitting note um, to end on. Um, it has truly been a pleasure, and I know that I am not alone in saying that it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to hear from one of Ghana's preeminent, brilliant minds on a topic that has so much value for the African continent and the world at large. Thank you. In, Thank you for the privilege. I really appreciate it. Thank you. In 2021, HAXA has a full schedule of exciting and fantastic events in store. So please stay involved. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to become a member of HAXA by joining the Sankofa Network or by simply donating to the HAXA Foundation. Visit our website, www.thehaxa.org for more information on how you can donate or join the Sankofa Network. So I'll now open up the floor um, to those who may want to interact with Ambassador Corte, we do have some time for you to turn on your microphones and your cameras and be able to directly engage with him. So I'm just checking to see if there are anybody, any, if anyone has a question, if you kindly raise your hand or um, enter your question in the chat box, I can um, acknowledge it and then um, allow you to ask, ask your question. Okay. I see here. Great. Um, Princess Kujo, I see that you have a question. Would you like to ask it directly? Princess, would you like to ask your question directly to Ambassador Corte? Okay. Um, Actually, what Princess Kujo sought to ask was how how um, I just, how 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 can how no how 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 can Agenda 2063 contribute to Agenda 2030? 
Yeah. Or something like that. Now, Agenda 2063 and Agenda 2030 of the United Nations are more or less identical twins. In so far as it contributes to Agenda 2063, it does contribute to Agenda 2030. That's really the connection. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. Our next question is from Rocky Dawuni. And as we, um, hopefully everyone is a huge fan of his work. Rocky has a you know, huge portfolio of music and he is also a Grammy nominated musician, proudly representing Ghana. Um, Rocky has a question. I think Rocky, would you like to ask your question directly by unmuting your microphone and turning on your camera? Yes. Hello Rocky, what, what go on? How are you man? What go on? <laughs> How are you, Mr. Ambassador? <laughs> Bye, thank you, bro. Bye, thank you. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Good to see you again, and uh, thank you for you an afternoon of uh, enlightenment and also the opportunity to ponder and discuss our continent, especially at a time like this. Um, my question, and I think it's um, something that probably during the course of your term, when we've met in Ethiopia and also uh, in, right. in New York. I've kind of uh, posted it to you, but it's as to how the arts uh, and uh, the artists, musician, the arts, the, the culture of our people can be made to play uh, a central role. First of all, in bringing our people together and creating connection because due to the colonial, uh, the borders and all of that, we still have a kind of issues to deal with bringing our people together. That's right. And then beyond that, to um, connecting our people to, to the diaspora, because I feel for us to move forward as a people uh, from the visions of Kwame Nkrumah, we need all these aspects to align for us to move forward. So how do you see uh, people like myself? I mean, I've already been doing that, but we require systemic connection and all of us being able to come together to see how we can work together forward. How do you see this happening? Actually, Rocky, uh, I would say that you're already doing this. You are, you are the Bob Mali of our times, you're the Bob Mali of Africa. Let's look at what effect Bob Mali had on spreading peace and good feeling across the world. I believe that uh, you are doing that for us. And what maybe official has to do now is to pay more attention and recognize what you're doing and give you all the support that you require. It also means that you must interact officials or often, I think you're already doing that. So yeah, you're on your way and God bless you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador Forte. I would now like to open the floor to our founder, Ambassador Swanaker. Um, he is the reason why that we are all here, and it's through her vision that HAXA was created. Um, Ambassador Swanaker? Yeah, I, I really liked Rocky's question, and I think Amazakote um, kind of dodged uh, the question a little bit. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think Rocky and, 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 and HAXA are in the same position, really. We, we are doing our bit, but we don't feel that um, support for either from our governments or the African Union or, or ECOWAS or, you know, you can call any kind of governmental institution. Um, so I think there's a problem with um, connecting, um, especially state funds, because that is what it really is about. Um, state funds to institutions and people who are Doing that work. If you how um, the American government uh, operates, for example, to be effective, or even the British government, um, government gives subventions to NGOs who are supporting the arts and culture and who have the expertise uh, to do it um, selflessly. Um, to this, this. Because not that um, be an expert in everything, and it is it is um, a, a good idea to put the money where people are working hard and passionate already. 
you know, um, you know, giving their time often for free, their resources for free. So if you put more resources there, you'll, you'll see uh, the results that you're looking for. From the point of view of reuniting the diaspora, which is the second uh, part of the question, um, HAXA is, is what HAXA is really about as well. So like um, to achieve this, we, we, this is foundable that um, done without today there's what's going on I'm sorry you're, you're breaking I can't out, hear you well. um, to see how we, yeah, okay Thing, um, the work of HAXA is um, to reunite the diaspora and make the effects of our work um, resonate and be stronger because we are working as a team. We are working as a reunited diaspora. And therefore, um, I feel like by empowering HAXA, by growing the network, by um, funding HAXA, because we're an NGO and we need um, help with funds, both from the international level, the state level, and the individual organizational level, uh, the, the work that we're doing can be amplified. And we like to have Rocky Darwini and join forces with him and people, individuals, or patients who want this same thing of reuniting the diaspora to work harder for Africa in all the dis different spheres, the, 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 the heritage, culture, arts, crafts, music, you name it. We, we want to work hard diaspora together and we feel the effect of a united diaspora would be so strong. And that's why we are so excited about the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, because it's, I think the change it will bring will be seismic. I think we don't even realize how important uh, this agreement is to the future of Africa. And I think we'll come back one day and, and, and watch this video and see this as January 2021, a seminal moment in the history of Africa when this um, agreement came to be. Because um, again, to answer Rocky's question, um, the fact that the borders are now open, the fact that people would be able to travel freely without visas and hopefully without having to bribe anybody, um, the fact that you can sell your services to in a different country, you can go perform, you can do whatever you need to do. That alone is going to generate so much activity and so much um, economic wealth for artists and um, Africans in general. So I, you know, to conclude my remark, I wanted to thank um, Ambassador Korte and um, Yawa Samwa and Yvonne Boche and GT Svanikia and Natasha Gordon and Kevin Menya and Estelle Kuei. Um, so these are the people who have made this webinar possible. Some of them are in the seats and some of them are in the front. Uh, and I'm really, really grateful for this teamwork. This is an example of what can be done. Um, and this um, webinar and interview will be put on YouTube for everybody um, to watch. And the message which um, Amza Kwate has given us today will reach so many more people. And that's why HAXA understands that digitization and innovation is one of the key things which can transform Africa. So before I conclude, I just want to say, um, I met Amaza Kote in Dakar, I think for the first time in Dakar. And um, I was really, really impressed at how brilliant a mind he had. He's an avid reader and he's a f one of the foremost intellectuals. In oh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, so we'll go- Interesting in the statement, but I think 
Ambassador Johanna and Rocky kind of preempted it, so they've asked most of it. I am very excited about this um, webinar, and I think we need a whole lot of time. I, what I would like, and I'm sure some of us would like, is a breakdown. So perhaps we should have a, a sequel to this. We should have a series of webinars only on, on the free trade agreement for uh, Africa, because I would like this to be taken stage by stage, article by article. How are we implementing it? And I think Ambassador Johanna talked about how do we reach Africa uh, uh, um, continental union, the African Union itself? Do we come by a petition? Do we come by a, an application to say we are an organization? Here's what we want to do. How can you help us? Because we know we do things like that with the UN. Can we do this with the AU? And um, the know-how, how do we do it? What are the step-by-step -step approach to it? So I'd love if, I know you're retiring, not that we agree with it, but we don't want to be that selfish. <laughs> But would like to have a series of this, um, Ambassador, and perhaps you can arrange that for us to go back and take the articles one by one and see how we as AXTA can benefit uh, 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 in, in, you know, implementing them or approaching the union to assist us. Okay. You spoke just like a lawyer, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what, I, what I can say is that uh, the African Union is a country-driven organization. It's a nation-driven like organization. Mm -hmm. It's an organization mm -hmm. of nation states. So a lot depends on where you start your application. You must start with the individual government. Okay, mm -hmm. now the individual government can combine one, two, or three of them, bring an mm -hmm. issue before the African Union at the level of Committee of Ambassadors, because you're the nations are represented at ambassadorial level, administrative mm -hmm. level. And when two or two or three of them are in unison, pressing an idea, it becomes part of the agenda mm -hmm. of the conference of ambassadors or the conference of ministers. And then it moves mm -hmm. up to the summit. And it becomes a decision mm -hmm. to be implemented. So that is really the way to do it. You can come straight to the African Union but the African Union takes instructions from the governments. From the government. So mm -hmm. it's a two-pronged affair, but it's more effective when you start with the nation. That's what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. Thank you, Lady Giftina we see for your comments and um, greetings. We do have Ambassador Swanaker. I see that you have your hand raised. If you would like to add an additional comment. Uh, um, yes. Um, so Lady Gifty is helping Hatsa to register in the UK. And um, of course, we have a branch of Hatsa in uh, the USA registered already. And we are also in the process of registering Hatsa in the Caribbean. Uh, because I remember when Ambassador Korte uh, was um, beginning his tenure at the AU, one of his concerns was um, the reuniting the diaspora in, in the way that Hatsa is trying to do. So we are spreading our tentacles wide. And if you have um, family, friends uh, around the world, tell them about Hatsa and encourage them to connect with us. Uh, for that purpose, we have set up the Sankofa network where we come together in forests like this to discuss um, issues that are pertinent to Africa. Today is the Africa Free Trade Ag Agreement, but another time it, it may be something else. We've spoken about COVID and how it's um, affected diaspora communities, um, etc. In 2021, in July, we are having the HAXA Summit uh, 2021. And uh, I heard the Gifty begging for more about the Africa Tree, Tree, Tree Agreement, breaking it down um, into smaller bite sizes. And then mm -hmm. the Haxa Summit 2021 ideal for, uh, for this. And I would like to invite Ambassador Korte back. Um, and maybe we create a panel uh, who can uh, address this uh, question which Lady Gifty has brought up, 
which is that, you know, there's so many dimensions to uh, mm -hmm. free trade in Africa. And so we need to hear from a variety of people um, who um, are actually involved in implementing it. And we're lucky that uh, we are based in the headquarters of the Africa mm -hmm. Free Trade Agreement. So we are going to reach out um, to the people in the Secretariat as well, uh, so that they can give us more information, which we can then pass on to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I see that we've got some good dis um, sharing that's happening in the chat from Carl and Daniel by sending links um, to the, um, I guess the UNESCO site, as well as um, some additional doc um, articles on connecting countries for regional activity, doc, um, giving further information on the AFCFTA. But this is a re truly a rare opportunity to be able to engage directly with Ambassador Corte. So I do hope that everyone who is joining will take advantage of this opportunity so please, I'm expecting to see some more hands raised or questions. Okay. All right. Um, so it looks like I think we don't have any more questions coming in. But again, um, Ambassador Corte, thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, and just for working on the behalf of all of us and being able to truly unite Africa and allow us to be the dominant force that we can be. Um, Thank you to the team and thank you, of course, Ambassador Swanaker and for everyone that has joined us today. Um, this has been truly a wonderful, wonderful webinar and we know that we'll be having more of these sessions as we go on in 2021. So thank you everyone for joining. If there are um, any, oh, we do have a question it appears. That's great. All right. Um, all right, <laughs> um, we have a question from Eugene Bochwe, um, my, my dad, <laughs> please, um, I think ask, and also um, a good friend of um, Ambassador Corte. Um, Mr. Bochwe, could you please ask your question? Oh yeah, it, it's just a comment. Great. Just a comment there. Um, I'm just delighted to see both of you. Uh, uh, I understand about that the court is in town. I haven't seen him, but uh, in, um, I, I, I've heard that he's around. Um, and um, um, I, I must say, this is the first time I'm hearing about a group. So I'm going to have to do some homework and see what the group is all about. And then uh, maybe starting with Yvonne, I will bombard you with questions as to exactly what, uh, when you started and what is the, you know, the ultimate aim of the, um, the group is. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, Uncle uh, Ambassador Kwesi Tommy, good to see you. Good yes. to see you. Yes. Uh, yes, it's been remiss of me. I should have come to pay my respects to you much earlier. But I promise go. I shall do that. There and then go. it will be a hard day. Really be a hard day's night. Hey, how cold is that? Is it <laughs> well, we'll go to thank you, Ambassador Corte. Thank you, Mr. Boshwe. Um, we'll now um, we do have another question from Sandra Tete. Thank you. I'm glad the questions are coming in now, um, because again, this is a unique opportunity. Please do take advantage of it. Um, our her question is: What are some of the infrastructural challenges that will affect the success of the free trade agreement, and what can governments do to offset this? You know, um, because of the partition of the continent and the interests of those who partition the continent, you find that the infrastructure is always from the gold mine to the port. There's hardly any infrastructure connecting two countries because the idea was to have enclaves which did not necessarily have to relate to each other. Now. The African Union, after liberation from the OAU, what is seeking to do 
is to bridge those gaps and disentangle those knots. So the infrastructure challenges there are, but what we need is now for our partners to help us with infrastructure to link the countries together, like railways from say, Takwadi Harbor, Tema Harbor, all the way through Burkina Faso to Mali, to Niger, to Cairo, or railways from the West Coast to the East Coast, or roads, but these are, these are infrastructure demands that are capital intensive. So we're talking about heavy outlay. And for that, we need people, investors, or coalitions of investors, or organizations who see value in Africa beginning to become an integrated whole as a partner to trade and investment. So we are inviting, I mean, I had, I had a discussion with uh, in Addis Ababa with the daughter of uh, Donald Trump, who said Donald Trump as a builder was interested in heavy, heavy capital outlets in Africa. I so said he's invited now to come and construct railways from north to east to west to south, roads, free airspace, airline connections. Those are the things that we need, but those are heavy capital outlays which can best be achieved on a continental level, obviously with continental planning. So we have to now move beyond the strictures of thinking within nation states to begin to think continentally. And as the Americans say, from sea to shining sea, we are seeking to create a continental nation out of a conglomeration of little nation states artificially created from outside. That is the challenge for the CFT. That's what we need to do. Indeed, that is quite a challenge, Ambassador Corte. Thank you. Our next question is from Brianne Clark. Brianne is asking, how does someone who is in the US be able to assist more? There's a lot of information for those on the African continent, but I can't find so much for us based in the United States. I believe, I believe that there's information on the portals of the CFTA, which can be accessed digitally. And that will be a beginning. So he should try and perhaps use Haxa to connect himself or herself to the AFCFTA or even the African Union website. That would be a beginning. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. We do have a comment from Marion Barbara Hesse. She's asking, are we able to utilize environmental grants? We should consider this collaboration. Yes, I don't see why not. There may be um, requirements to be met, but it's, you know, we, we're looking at an integrated whole of several disparate parts. I don't see why not. Of course, of course. We do have a follow-up question from Sandra Tete. Sandra is asking, what is in the AFCFTA for younger diasporans who wish to set up business on the continent? No, the, the, the point is to make business establishments easier to developing a one-stop shop, which will make it possible for you to establish anywhere you want. But uh, the devil, as they say, is always in the detail. And we need to look at the agreement closely and find out whether perhaps provision has been made for it already or oh, it's one of the things that you can begin to think about because you see this is an organic arrangement it grows with use and with time it's a self-developing entity because it's a very new thing we're not developing with new challenges new ideas and we welcome ideas from the diaspora in the united states which we, share, which we cherish very much because they already have done that the u.s built a continental nation from a disparate group of nation states, which fought the civil war in 1776. They created this uh, entity 
based on the rule of law and the pursuit of liberty and happiness. It has become an example to all of us as to what you can do, visionary leadership and determination to bring people together. So the US is a prime example of what CFTA seeks to do. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. We do have a question from, um, and again, I've been reading out the questions, but if you do want to ask your question directly, I'll give you that opportunity. So I do have a follow-up question from Sandra Tete. Sandra, did you want to ask your question directly? Uh, yes, please. Thank you so much. Let me put my camera on. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to ask um, what routes can citizens use to hold the signatories, i.e. the countries of the Continental Free Trade Agreement to account? That's, a, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I, 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 I suppose the, the probably legal provisions but as of now, what I see about the agreement is just to try and establish the organization. As to liabilities and potential liabilities, I think they're probably now beginning to think through those issues. But that should not prevent you if you have an issue. Not to go at it. It's part of the process of seeking where you can achieve your aims in justice, part of the procedures. So we need to look at the agreement and uh, talk more to the people in the secretary. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. Thank you, Sandra. Um, we have another question from Ishan Lawson. Um, Ishan, would you, Ishan Lawson, would you like to ask your question directly to Ambassador Corte? Um, thank you very much, Yvonne, and thank you, Ambassador. Um, can you hear me? I can yes. hear you, but I cannot see you. <laughs> um, please pardon me for that. <laughs> so my question, and um, thank you so much for um, the discussion on the um, free trade agreement in Africa. I think it holds a lot of opportunity uh, for exchange. Um, looking at the intersections uh, with um, cultural heritage and um, conservation of our heritage, I wonder whether as um, the AU works towards implementing this uh, flagship project, which are largely infrastructural in nature, and they're going to facilitate trade, they're going to facilitate exchange. How can we connect that with um, aspiration five of um, the Africa we want, which seeks to, ha to create an Africa, uh, to build an Africa with a, with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, shared values and ethics. How do we make those connections between the flagship projects? Because the opening up of our exchanges amongst ourselves is critical to, ex, um, to understanding uh, ourselves, to, to breaking down the bridges. Um, and I think it's so interesting that it's easier for Africans to travel outside of Africa than to travel within Africa. And so that cultural exchange is really lost. So how do we, um, you know, tie into that, you know, the aspirations and and, and those flagship projects within the cultural and um, and the heritage? Uh, Thank you, sir. That, that's a good point. Uh, the two are very much interrelated, and actually, one is very much central to the other. They are interconnected. But it's a task that we need to work at slowly, systematically. So I agree with you, one, Madam. Thank you, Ambassador Corte. Thank you, um, Ishan Lawson, for your question. Uh, so we are nearing the end um, of our the ex, you know the extended informal engagement. Um, so just going to give a last um, request for questions, comments, um, or just general greetings to Ambassador Corte. So. Please, if you do have a question or comment again, a very, very rare and unique opportunity to be engaging with someone of Ambassador Corte's caliber. So kindly, um, please take advantage of the opportunity. Um, we'll be closing in just a few minutes. So we'll just be opening the floor for a few more questions. Okay, I don't know if we have any takers, just gonna check with the team if we have anything. Um, so I think then um, 
unless once, twice, okay. It looks like then, um, again, thank you, Ambassador Corte, again, we are so thankful um, for your participation and even through the formal and the informal engagement, being able to open up, you know, your um, brilliant mind just for us to be able to understand a little bit more about the AFCFTA and also the vision um, that you have for Africa for the future. We are truly thankful and very, very grateful for your time. And again, to everyone who participated, asked questions, uh, made comments in the chat box, thank you so much for your support and for your interaction. Um, definitely, we really appreciate it. And thank you again to the HACSA team, um, Ambassador Swanaker, GT, Natasha, Estelle, everyone Everyone who worked so hard to be able to put this event together. Thank you, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you again, Ambassador Corte. Thank you for the privilege of Thank you, everyone. Thank you.